This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau, victim visas, one-way mirrors, and what the heck are Haida, Hifka, and Osadef? I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode number 57 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. And this week, I'm answering your questions about staying in the United States if you've been the victim of a crime but hold no immigration status, the truth about those one-way mirror observation rooms, and explaining what the heck a Haida, a Hifka, and an Osadef are. But before we get into that, I have a bunch of people I need to thank. As always, I need to thank my Gold Shield patrons, Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, C.C. Jameson from CCJameson.com, Larry Keaton, Vicki Tharp of VickiTharp.com, Dharma Kelleher of DharmaKelleher.com, Chris Ann, Jimmy Co. of CrimmyBox.com, and Larry Darter for their support. I'd also like to thank all of my Coffee Club patrons for their support every single month. Your support keeps the lights on in the Bureau. And you can find links to all of the writers supporting this episode in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 57. And to learn more about setting up your own Patreon account for your author business, visit writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. This week's first question comes from Jody Burnett, and you can find her work at jody-burnett.com. Jody writes, Hi, Adam. Let me first say I love your podcast. Well, thank you very much, Jody. I listen every week, and I'm enjoying the backlist as well. I glean new story ideas with almost every episode. Well, I'll try to up that to every single episode. <laughs> uh, my question is regarding my female protagonist. She is a British citizen who lived with her mother in Scotland until she was 16. Her American father went to Scotland to get her and take her to America for the summer, but instead he abducted her and kept her hidden away in a militia compound in northern Idaho. Ten years later, she manages to steal her father's phone and call the police to warn them of a domestic terrorist attack the group is planning in Chicago. Her information prevents the attack. When the FBI, ATF, and Homeland Security figure out exactly where the compound is and raid it, my character is rescued. What would happen to her now? I think she'd be interviewed and would testify at the trial of the bad guys. But what about after that? She is a British citizen, but has no passport. Would she be given one and deported? How long could she stay in the States? Could an FBI agent, read love interest, be assigned to escort her back to Scotland? One follow-up question to this scenario. The compound is in Idaho. The thwarted terrorist attack happened in Chicago. Would the trial take place in Idaho or Illinois? Thank you so much for your help. Jody, your female protagonist would probably qualify for an American U visa, and that's the letter U. A U visa lets victims of crimes who meet certain requirements stay in the United States. In your story's domestic terror plot, she's technically a witness, but she's also the victim of a parental kidnapping. So it's the kidnapping case that would make her eligible for the U visa. And to qualify for a U visa, there's three requirements. The first is a crime requirement, meaning that she is the victim of a crime. The second is a helpfulness requirement. So she needs to have helped either law enforcement or the prosecution. And the third is a harm requirement, meaning that she suffered some sort of physical or emotional harm from the crime. So she clearly suffered um, harm, was helpful in the prosecution, and uh, was the victim of a crime when it comes to the kidnapping, but not necessarily with the domestic terror situation. So that means you can use this, if depending on how you want the story to go, you can you know, hang the U visa over her head and not have her get it if you want her to go back to Scotland. Or if you'd like to keep her in the States, you can have them pursue the kidnapping case as well. So the reason you would go after a U visa is because it provides a few benefits. One, you can legally live in the United States for four years. And after having three years of having the U visa, you can actually apply for a green card to stay in the U.S. permanently. And then if you get that green card, you can actually go on to apply to become a U.S. citizen. And also with a U visa, you get permission to work in the United States, which can be huge for 
uh, being able to survive, and many other visa holders do not have this option. It's currently taking um, probably six to nine months, from what I've read, uh, to hear back whether or not a U visa has been approved or not. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would be the way that she could stay in the United States if you want that to happen in the story. As for the trial, it would definitely happen in federal court since this is going to be an FBI ATF, um, Homeland Security kind of case, but which district it happens in, whether that's the ninth district for Idaho or the seventh district for Chicago would depend on the circumstances. Did the terrorists make it to Chicago and have their plan in motion? In particular, had any of the members made an act in furtherance of that terror attack within the boundaries of that judicial district? Uh, when the attack was thwarted? Or were they still at the compound in Idaho putting everything together when it was thwarted? You can certainly tailor your story to fit whatever would be your preferred courtroom setting. But if you've written the story for maximum thwarted in the nick of time kind of drama, I would imagine that your case would likely be heard in Illinois, which is the seventh district for the U.S. federal court system. Thanks so much for your question, Jody. You can find Jody's work at jody-burnett.com. This week's next question comes from Coffee Club patron Robin Lyons of robinlyons.com. Robin writes, Hi, Adam. Thank you for your time and effort to produce the podcast. The knowledge you share with us creatives is invaluable. Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And thank you for your support on Patreon. I appreciate it. So Robin goes on to say, when interviewing or interrogating someone at the main office, police or sheriff, is there really a side room with one-way mirror where others can watch and listen without being seen? If so, does this room have an official name? And how about a common nickname? Thank you, Robin. You know, it's funny, Robin, I was just thinking about this while watching Mindhunter on Netflix, so I wonder if that was also the reason why you thought about it. Um, I'm sure in some police station somewhere, um, likely built in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s, uh, there's still a one-way mirror. Uh, they'd likely have called it an observation room, and I'm sure there are some still around, but I have not seen them in my experience in California, at least, or to any of the police stations I've been to out of state on the investigations that I've worked. In my experience, it is far more common to not have a mirror. And instead, they would have video cameras in the interview rooms. And those may either be hidden or prominently mounted where they can tell that it's in there. Um, and in the observation room or monitoring room or recording room, which is any of those is what we might refer to that room as, um, that's where others can watch and listen as the interview or interrogation is being audio and video recorded. The next time you watch an episode of The First 48, which is the reality series, look for whether the rooms have mirrors or not. I can't think of an episode that did have mirrors in those interview rooms, but it, very often we will see the filming crew is um, shooting a shot right over the shoulder of a detective that's monitoring the video feed of an interview uh, that's going on in the next room. So that detective is usually sitting in that monitoring or recording room. And I should also mention that real estate inside a police station is usually at a premium. So the room that we're talking about as that recording room or observation room is usually no bigger than a custodian or maintenance closet. I mean, it's usually pretty small and it's packed with a couple of DVRs or if it's still old school VHS recorders with monitors and headsets for you to be able to listen in. And that room likely controls the recording equipment for all of the interview rooms in that office. Most detective bureaus will have at least two interview rooms. And contrary to the trope that we see on TV over and over again, we never bring witnesses into that room to watch a live interview or interrogation. And the one that is doing the monitoring is usually my partner or the supervisor, which is usually a detective sergeant. Thanks so much for the question, Robin. You can find Robin's work at robinlyons.com. Chris Lefebvre writes, Hi, Adam. I recently discovered your podcast, and I'm very grateful for your service to crime writers. My question this week is about Haida, 
and the role it plays in drug investigations by agencies of all levels, whether the DEA or state or local police and sheriffs. Does a county with a HIDA designation simply receive more grant money for existing narcotics work, or do feds exert more control, i.e. requiring interagency collaboration and involvement with fusion centers or other intelligence-gathering organizations? Most literature found online that pertains to HIDA is vague and repetitive. I was hoping you had an insight in this seemingly giant program. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Chris. And I totally see what you mean about vague and repetitive. <laughs> the best vague description I found online is HIDA brings the agencies together, provides the concept, structure, and additional resources for the participating agency's manpower and expertise to accomplish enhanced and meaningful outcomes. <laughs> you can definitely tell that the feds are involved just by that description. So what is HIDA? HIDA is how we pronounce the acronym that stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. According to the DEA website, HIDAs are a grant program created by Congress in 1988 through the Anti-Drug Abuse Act and are administered by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the ONDCP, which again is still very vague. HIDAs in reality are permanent, federally funded drug task forces that exist in major areas of illegal drug production, manufacturing, importation, or distribution. So these task forces are made up of federal, state, and local investigators, not unlike the other federal task forces I've mentioned on previous episodes, like the FBI's JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, or the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. Uh, only HIDAs are focused on large-scale drug trafficking and money laundering investigations, usually with the DEA, which is the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, as the major stakeholder. And these HIDA task forces are staffed with DEA special agents working alongside cross-sworn state and local investigators. So like those other federal task forces we've talked about, that means the local police detective assigned to the HIDA will be cross-sworn to enforce federal law, and they will technically be a special deputy U.S. marshal. So HIDAs will have federal agents and local investigators working as a single team on investigations targeting the bigger fish in the drug or money laundering trade. Since HIDAs are solely located in major illegal drug areas, they are better equipped to go after like cartel level investigations compared to a local police department's narcotics team, mainly because of the federal funding. And funding plays an important role in wiretap investigations because it can cost thousands of dollars to put a single wiretap up. Um, and many of these larger investigations will actually involve dozens of wiretaps. And that doesn't even begin to cover the costs of having monitors listening around the clock and that sort of thing. Um, and yes, Chris, they do interact closely with other agencies, um, especially given that everyone on the task force is usually from another agency. And they work closely with drug intelligence centers. So these HIDA cases are often a combination, uh, or these HIDA task forces work cases that are often a combination of surveillance, running of informants, uh, being up on wiretaps, all with the goal of taking down the organization through search and arrest warrants that ultimately result in federal drug trafficking, money laundering, or RICO charges. I will include a link in the show notes, uh, which you can find at writersdetective.com forward slash 57 to the DEA webpage that shows a map of every HIDA in the country. So you might be surprised which counties actually have a HIDA. Now, to qualify for consideration as a HIDA, a high intensity drug trafficking area, an area must meet the following criteria. The area is a significant center of illegal drug production, manufacturing, importation, or distribution. State, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies have committed resources to respond to the drug trafficking problem in the area, thereby indicating a determination to respond aggressively to the problem. So the feds aren't being relied upon to take care of the problem. The locals need to be involved in this as well, and that usually means putting those detectives or investigators on the task force. Drug-related activities in the area are having a significant harmful impact in the area and other areas of the country. And finally, a significant increase in allocation of federal resources is necessary to respond adequately to drug-related activities in the area. 
And I keep mentioning money laundering. There are also, and usually it's the same locations as a Haida, there are also high intensity financial crimes areas, which are called HIFKAs. So I will save that for another podcast episode entirely. But where there's drug money, um, there's obviously financial crime as well. And obviously not all areas of the country would qualify for a Haida. But there may be large-scale cases that pop up in non-Haida areas that warrant putting together a Haida-like task force to take down that one big group, more of a short-term case-specific task force, which might be helpful if you're setting a drug trafficking story in a remote area, like in the show Ozark, for example. Now, this doesn't happen in the story, so it's not a spoiler, Um, but if the story in the TV show Ozark was my case, I would be looking into making it an OSIDEF case. So what the heck is OSIDEF? OSIDEF is the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force Program, and it was established in 1982. And according to their website, it was established to mount a comprehensive attack and reduce the supply of illegal drugs in the United States and diminish the violence and other criminal activity associated with the drug trade. Now, I can't help but notice that OSIDEF predates Haida's by six years. So I'm betting that the Haida program came about by identifying the need for permanent task forces in these high-intensity drug trafficking areas. That's totally speculation on my part, because honestly, I didn't bother to research it, but I would guess that it's a pretty strong possibility. Um, and I should mention that Haida and OSIDEF come from different pots of federal money when it comes to the funding, and they report to different offices back in Washington, D.C., but they all pretty much have the same goals, which the DEA website so eloquently lists as arrest drug traffickers, dismantle, disrupt drug trafficking and money laundering organizations, reduce the illegal drug supply, seize assets, and bring criminals to the United States justice system or competent jurisdiction. So in short, Chris, Haida and even OSIDEF are essentially well-funded drug task forces that are set up to go after the big dogs in the drug trafficking trade. Now, for those of you that are parents, grandparents, or even just writers wanting to learn about drug slang and symptomology without going off into the uh, rabbit hole of research in a corner of the internet you may not want to be in, I will include a link in the show notes to the publications page on getsmartaboutdrugs.gov, which is a DEA website for parents, educators, and caregivers. It's a safe place on the internet to research drug abuse and to learn about what kind of symptoms uh, or symptomology people under the influence will show, as well as a place to look up the slang names for drugs to find out what they really are. Thanks for the great question, Chris. I appreciate it. Now, before we go, I have a question for you. How many passwords do you have? And how often do you reuse your passwords? You know, changing them by one character or using the same one over and over again. It's kind of like flossing, I think, right? We don't really think about it. And when we do, we know we should do better. And then one day it all catches up to us. Managing your passwords, and I mean secure passwords, shouldn't be like pulling teeth. I've been using LastPass as my password manager for years. It was actually the third password manager I tried, and it was by far the easiest to use and the most robust. It generates strong passwords for me, securely stores all of my passwords, my credit card info, and even notes I make to myself. This way, you only need to remember one password, and that's the one to get into LastPass. Getting started with LastPass is totally free, and upgrading to LastPass Premium, like I did, is just three bucks a month, which allows you to sync your entire LastPass vault across all of your devices. I have it on my phone, tablet, laptop, desktop, and I can even access it through the website when I'm away from my devices. It's super fast and easy to log into any website that you have a username and password saved for. If you're interested in checking out LastPass for free, 
or you can help keep the lights on in the bureau by upgrading to LastPass Premium for three bucks a month. You can use my affiliate link by going to writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash LastPass. I only promote products I actually use and trust, and my affiliate links never add any additional cost to you. LastPass is the only password manager I use, and I've been using it for years, at least a dozen times a day. So go to writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash LastPass to get your password situation totally squared away. Thank you so much for listening this week. Keep those questions coming. You, yes, you can send me your crime fiction questions by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week and write well.